Hello. Hello. Better. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad everyone made it here. Um, I'm actually pleasantly surprised so many people here. I was expecting to hear a very few people here, uh, but this is actually a treat. Uh, I'm not going to take attendance today because I didn't bring the roll sheet because I was anticipating no one would be here. You pleasantly surprised me. In fact, if you check your emails now, which you ought not do, I just sent an email to your classmate saying you can watch the live stream, which I'm doing now, uh, and email me questions. But I think everyone's here, so I am. And although I, I, I promise you, I traveled. I think we actually have maybe plus one uh, more than usual. Uh, but I promise you, I traveled the furthest. So yesterday was kind of. Uh, 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 I know everyone. Please, we start. Good, thank you. So yesterday I was at the Supreme Court uh, uh, for arguments in the United States versus Texas case. Um, so the long and short of it, all of our discussion of take care clause, right? All of our discussion whether the president has faithfully executed the law. How many questions were asked about the take care clause? Zero. Zero questions. So what, what does that tell us? Um, it tells us one of two things. Uh, the justices who want to ask about it were not able to ask questions yesterday. One of those being Justice Scalia, who is no longer with us, and one of those being Justice Thomas, who doesn't ask questions. Um, so I, I, I suspect either of those two were the uh, people who asked the court to inquire at the take care clause. Uh, but all hope is not lost. Um, in terms of the constitutional issue, um, this isn't the first time. So I mentioned a case before I'll mention again today, McDonald v. City of Chicago. This was a Chicago handgun case, and the question was, does the Second Amendment apply to the states? Um, as you've read in your reading for today, uh, virtually the entire Bill of Rights was extended to the states through the Due Process Clause. Um, it's wrong, but that's how the court has done it. In McDonald, the court asked for an additional question, the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Not a single justice adopted that approach except for Justice Thomas. So in the event that the court actually reaches a decision on something, uh, we will actually get perhaps a uh, concurring or dissenting, as it were, opinion from Justice Thomas on the take care clause. Um, the arguments went quite well yesterday. I, th I think, um, I'm sure you've read various things, but uh, um, uh, it, it looks like it's in for a tie, and the effect of a tie is a firm of Fifth Circuit's injunction, um, which I think is probably the uh, uh, most likely scenario, but I am awful at making these predictions, so I will not. Um, Immediately after I exited the court, I looked at my phone and said, United has canceled your flight. Lovely. Um, so because of the massive rain, uh, my flight yesterday was canceled. I had a flight this morning at 8.40 a.m. I landed around 10.30. I got to school about 45 minutes ago. If the suit looks a little wrinkled, it should, because I've worn it more times than I should have. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to go with it. Uh, uh, and I was, uh, I'm ready to roll, always. Um, is everyone okay? I hope, hope everyone... <laughs> I once took a I once took a red eye from San Francisco right to a 9 a.m. class. That was a mistake. I will not do that again. Uh, uh, you know, red eyes basically I landed like at 7:30 a.m. from all night flight. Uh, not doing that one again. But I did that once. <coughs> okay. Any questions? Anything in your minds? Give me a chance to catch my breath, perhaps. Thinking anything? No. Nothing really. No questions. Okay. All right, so we are done with the 14th Amendment. Not really, but we are done with the 14th Amendment. In the last class, we discussed Obergefell, we discussed Lawrence, we discussed Windsor. We are moving on. In our remaining three classes, we don't have nearly enough time. If you see how many pages I'm skipping around, it's awful. We will cover the First Amendment. Today and on Tuesday, we will discuss the free speech provisions. And on... The last class, we will discuss freedom of religion. Um, not nearly enough time to cover this, but I will do the best I can to give you some sense. Um, and I don't even like saying this out loud, but this is a shame. There is a bar exam for con law, right? The bar exam is a con law section. 50% of the questions on the bar for con law are about the First Amendment. The topic which we don't teach, which other professors don't teach at all. So I'll, I'll let you have at it what you will, but you'll at least have something of a leg up. This is what drives me nuts, that the only thing in this class that actually matters is the bar we don't teach. But I will, I will, uh, 
but I'm not allowed to deviate. We actually have pretty strict guidelines what we have to teach. I have, I squeeze these three three in because I move quickly elsewhere. That's how I can fit these in. Otherwise, I I wouldn't even have time for them. But I will do the best that I can. Okay. Okay. So let's get started. So our class actually begins where it probably should have started. If you notice, the very first case of the book is not Marbury. It's Baron v. Baltimore. So when the Constitution was being drafted, um, there was a vigorous debate. What was this debate? Do we need a Bill of Rights? Do we need a Bill of Rights? Do we need amendments which specifically spell out what rights the people have against federal infringement? So there were two camps. There were two schools of thoughts. There were the, excuse me, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists, as in the Federalist Papers, proposed, I'm sorry, favor the ratification of the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists opposed ratification of the Constitution. And one of the biggest grievances, one of the biggest gripes of the Anti-Federalists was the absence of a Bill of Rights, was the absence of amendments or, or any provisions that guarantee the rights of the people. So let me try and explain this. I think I've used this example before. Okay. Um, oh, does anyone remember what I finished off last time? Good memory. I, this, I, I think I left Friday morning. I just got back. So my, my memory is nowhere. Um, all right. Dylan, tell me, sir. If Congress passed a law in 1789, right after the Constitution was ratified, and said, you cannot wear a hat. You cannot wear a hat. You're wearing a hat, which is perfect, right? So Congress says, we will throw you in jail. If you wear a hat, we'll give you a trial, we'll give you a jury, but if you wear this hat, you're in jail. We're going to lash you, you know, caning, whatever, right? Would that, would that law be constitutional in, in 1789? Yes. Um, oh. Okay, that's the wrong answer. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that. This is a law from Congress, right? How would, under what power would Congress enact that law? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's why, I, that's why, that's why I travel 3,000 miles to ask it, exactly, right? It's straight, straight from the airport. Good question. Think back to the first quarter of our semester. What authority would vest Congress the power to say that you sitting in this classroom right here in Texas cannot wear a hat? And what enumerated power could Congress rely on in 1789 to make that determination? But necessary and proper to execute which power? Which power are they starting with? All right, necessary and proper doesn't stand by itself. It's always as a surplus to enumerated power. So which power, would, you said it's constitutional, which, which power would Congress rely on? Um, okay, was it going left or right? Who's, who's next? Who are you going to? Oh, she's like, there. Go there. <laughs> Man, that, that was like the fastest point I've seen. All right. Chloe, tell me, sir, which power would Congress have to rely on to enact that sort of law? This is not a hard question. I mean, I mean, it may not be a good argument, but which, which power would you think they would try and cite? Uh, I saw someone hand up. Congress, Congress Clause, right? Commerce Clause is, do we forget, do you forget the Commerce Clause already? That's bad, right? We spent like four weeks on it, right? The Commerce Clause is the last best hope of all enumerated powers, right? But of course, and I'll come back to you, Colby, in 1789, what was that? In 1789, <laughs> laughing at your friends suffering. In 1789, did, was the Commerce Clause understood to regulate you also wearing a hat in Texas in one spot? Could Congress go after a person in one state with, with a hat? Um, I don't think it necessarily was. Um, necessarily, that's an e this is an easy one. Yeah, um, no it wasn't. Okay, good, yeah, don't, don't equivocate. But, and this is an example, don't give me maybes, right? Maybes don't tell me anything. Maybe tells me you don't know the answer. Give me a yes or no. Take a stand, right? This maybe tells me you're not sure. Give me an answer, if it's right or wrong, in most cases, my exam, yes or no are actually correct answers. So it goes both ways. But don't, don't give me maybe. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost it's, it's a weak answer. All right, so what's your answer? No. Ah, I love it. No. Good. <laughs> Strong answer. 
Okay. So then, uh, 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 then uh, Elizabeth, with the, with the absence of any sort of protection for individual freedom of matter, if Congress couldn't use any powers to go after people wearing hats. Right. Let me ask you a follow-up, Elizabeth. So what if Congress in 1789 passed a law saying, we are shutting down all printing presses, right? We are going to just confiscate every printing press. We don't like these newspapers, you know, printing trash about us, right? We're going to confiscate and we're going to, you know, basically destroy every single printing press in the United States. Congress passed that law. Why could not they pass that law? Exactly. Everyone, everyone hear what you just said, which is exactly correct. In 1789, before the Bill of Rights, before the Bill of Rights was even ratified, Congress would have lacked the power to do stuff that infringed on the sorts of liberties we think of as protected by the Bill of Rights. They didn't have a power to confiscate printing presses, right? That, that wasn't a power that they had. They didn't have a power to tell, tell poor Colby that he can't wear his hat, okay? So here was a debate. The Federalists were saying, listen, guys, we don't need a Bill of Rights. If we construe the enumerated powers, right, if we <laughs> construe the structural provisions of our Constitution correctly, we're not going to have a problem here, right? As long as we understand that commerce is commerce, and that means in one state, and we, we keep that narrow, then we don't need a Bill of Rights. We don't need it. Pikachu, right? We, we don't need it, right? <laughs> But what happened then, um, Nicole? Did did Congress stick to a very narrow conception of enumerated powers? Uh, it did not. What happened? And what what cases am I thinking of? Um, Beautiful, McCulloch, Maryland, right? In McCulloch, the Chief Justice said, "Well, you had this narrow version of the Commerce Clause, <laughs> which was by John, i sorry, James Madison, <laughs> and they had this broad version by Hamilton. I like Hamilton." Even though both Madison and Hamilton were the Federalist Papers, they, they departed, uh, as it were. So, so you're exactly right, Nicole, right? This was the fear of the anti-Federalists. said, listen, we're not stupid here, right? We know as soon as this federal government gets going, they're going to see words like commerce. They're going to see words like necessary and proper, and they're going to expand it. And they're going to do stuff that ought not to be done. So the anti federal said, okay, Let's not, let's not leave this to chance here, right? Let's not leave it to chance. Let's make clear that they can't smash printing presses, right? Let's make clear that they can't go and invade the liberties of the people. In other words, the anti-federalists were convinced that the structural provisions of our Constitution were inadequate to prevent the government from infringing on people's freedoms. They did not trust structure enough which is something that you know, may seem foreign after learning this entire topic on structure. And um, in hindsight, in hindsight, I think it's safe to say that Federalists proved to be on point. Their fears um, have proven out. And over the last 200 years, the court has gradually slipped on the separation of powers and have given the central government greater and greater authority. And that's why most of you think that the Bill of Rights is the Constitution. That's what most people are taught because that's all they think about. Oh, free speech, you know, Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. But that wasn't the original plan. Okay. But in any event, in any event, when the Constitution was ratified in 1789, a number of states said, okay, we're only ratifying this on the condition that we pass some amendments. Right? They said, fine. We understand you couldn't get all these... Uh, 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 liberties into the first draft of the Constitution. Let's, you know, amend it. We have this provision. Let's amend it later, uh, uh, and that way we'll fix it up. So one of the first acts of Congress, the very first Congress in 1789, was to start moving on amendments. And in the House of Representatives, one of the leaders of this was, again, a guy named James Madison. So he not only was the uh, one of the key contributors to the Constitution itself, he was one of the primary authors of the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Ninth Amendment. The, I mean, he wrote a lot of them. Not all of them, but he wrote a lot of them. What, what we know, okay? So everyone with me so far? Let's walk through the process by which an amendment actually happens. Um, it's only occurred 27 times in our republic's history. If you go look you know, at, at constitutions in Europe, 
or even the Texas Constitution, there are hundreds and thousands of amendments. I mean, these things go on for pages and pages. Next time you go to vote in Texas an election, just look at the number of amendments being put on the ballot. <coughs> these are fairly easy to add. And in many respects, it, it diminishes the relevance of an amendment if it's so easy to add. Our Constitution does not make it easy to add an amendment. Indeed, it's the exact opposite. It was designed to make it very difficult to amend this super duper important charter. It was not put to a mere majority vote, which is how uh, uh, some other countries allow it. So if you turn to page um, in your constitutions on page 34 at the bottom, I have it up here if you don't have it, but 34. Article five of the constitution, the fifth article, spells out the procedures by which the Constitution can be amended. And there are two paths to kick it off, right? There are two paths to get the process started. The first pass, first pass, the first path is a two thirds of both houses of Congress. That is two thirds of the House of Representatives and two thirds of the Senate must agree that an amendment is, is warranted. Now, mind you, when this was drafted, there were 13 states. So we're talking 26 senators, and uh, I can't remember the number, but like basically 30 or so representatives. Getting two-thirds of 13 versus getting two-thirds of 100, what we have now, is very different. So built into this numerically, as the republic grows and new states are added, it becomes harder and harder to reach that two-thirds number. So keep that in mind. As hard as it was to get these first 10 amendments through, it's a lot harder to get the 28th Amendment through today. But there's an alternate path. We don't have to rely on the branches of government. If two-thirds of the states call for a constitutional convention, that's another path. And again, when there are 13 states Two-thirds of that's actually pretty easy to get. When there's 50 states, two-thirds is a lot tougher. Okay. So what happens? After two-thirds of both houses of Congress agree, the next step is ratification. Three-fourths of the states must agree to the same phrasing of the amendment. So you need two-thirds of both houses of Congress and then 75% of the states. That is a lot of agreement on how to amend this charter. Um, the alternate path is if two, I'm sorry, if two thirds of the states in convention call for a constitutional convention, they bypass Congress altogether. And then the states effectively hold their own conventions to amend the constitution. And I'll mention this briefly, uh, but there's something of a concern that once states call for a convention, they're not bound. This is a so-called runaway convention theory, that once a convention convenes, they can propose whatever amendments they want. Now, I, I, I don't really care about these criticisms because they still need three-fourths of the states to ratify. So even if all these crazy amendments are thrown in by whatever state, you still need three-fourths to ratify. So I think it's a vastly overblown concern. Yeah? Has an amendment ever been proposed that way? No. So it's all going nope. to <coughs> Yep. All 27 of our amendments have come from Congress. We've never had it. Although it's interesting, and I think um, uh, uh, it might be in your reading, the balanced budget amendment, which has been bandied about for years, is getting really close to two-thirds of the states. I mean, uh, someone check my math. I think you need 36 to get to two-thirds now. What is it? Whatever it is, we're like three or four states short. Whatever, whatever the number is, I can't, I'm too tired. Whatever the number is, we're like three or four states short. So I mean, we're getting awfully close to two thirds of the states have, have called for a convention to balance budget amendment. Um, even though I don't think it can actually yield anything of merit, I think it'll be an excellent educational opportunity for people to actually engage in civics and to discuss this. I, I think it'll be awesome. I, I often joke that I'll blog about you know the you know tweeting of the of the constitutional convention. I, th I think that'd be that'd be fun. But uh, uh, I'll be the reporter for Texas. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. Okay. You're right. What's your son? What's, what's his name? Nicholas. Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. It's okay. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to me either if I was there. <laughs> so one of the most interesting amendments 
is the 27th Amendment. And there's a little blur about this in your book. Did I tell you the story of the 27th Amendment? Did I tell you the story? Oh, this is a good story. So uh, a couple months ago, I, this guy came to my office, was doing an interview or something, and you know, I have a stack of constitutions on my desk, and I always <laughs> give them to people, because it's like, it's, you know, it's a treat. And he's like, oh, no, I don't need that. I read it already. I'm like, oh, really? When did you read it? Middle school. Like, oh, really? What year did you graduate? 1989. You didn't read the 27th Amendment. Take it. <laughs> was not yet ratified. So I, I caught him. I was nailed. Him. <laughs> so the 27th Amendment has an interesting story. Here, here's another misconception. People often say, well, the First Amendment is first because it's most important. No. It was actually third. You will blow your friends away if you say that the First Amendment was the third proposed amendment. They won't even know that. You guys will. So originally, there were not 10 amendments proposed. There were 12. The First Amendment concerned districting and how you apportion representatives. Yawn, right? And the second one concerned congressional pay. This one actually makes sense. It basically says Congress can't raise its own salary. Here, no law varying the compensation for the services of senators shall take effect until the elections intervene. Basically, if Congress gives itself a massive pay raise, the voters can throw the bums out. I mean, that's the, that's the general idea of this amendment. It did not receive enough support in 1789 to be put forward. So what we now know is the first amendment of free speech and free exercise, that was actually the third amendment. So you can to stump all of your friends in trivia. But what was interesting is that over time, states started saying, you know, we should ratify this. And even though we had more than 13 states, states kept ratifying this amendment until Michigan. In May of 1992, I mean, I think mo most of you were alive, right? No. See, eventually it's going to be none of you are alive. <laughs> I, the thing about this job is I age and you don't. Um, Every year I'm here, the gap gets bigger, which I'm fully aware of. I didn't have glasses when I started here. So this is actually the first semester I wore glasses. So in 1992, Michigan was the 38th state to get ratification. So now it's in the Constitution. Is there a time limit? Eh, unclear. But now Congress can't raise its own pay. Um, this actually came up uh, during the government shutdown a couple of years ago. A senator proposed a bill that was said Cong members of Congress can't get paid when there's a government shutdown. Nope. It has, to, it has to be after the next election. It could not come into effect right away. So that bill is unconstitutional. Never went anywhere. But uh, I, will, I, I raised the hackles at the time. Don't forget the 27th Amendment. It's, it's, it's there. They're all there. We ignore enough of the Constitution. Let's not ignore the provisions people don't think about. All right. Uh, there also were a number of failed amendments. Um, what's interesting is we now know the 13th Amendment as the amendment that, would, uh, that eliminated slavery. But a proposed amendment that would have been number 13 was the Corwin Amendment. And the Corwin Amendment basically said that the Constitution protects slavery. It would have basically um, uh, uh, codified Dred Scott as a constitutional holding. Um, but that one never got enough votes. Um, we also talked about the 11th Amendment, which was meant to reverse Chisholm v. Georgia, uh, which concerned the ability to sue states. Uh, there's also a child labor amendment, which was uh, uh, picked up a lot of steam, but once a new deal happened and the court held that Congress could regulate commerce by labor or whatever else, it became some of a moot point. Um, another amendment that never quite got ratified was the Equal Rights Amendment, which would basically said uh, the Constitution protects uh, a gender discrimination. But again, the Supreme Court's intermediate scrutiny jurisprudence obviated that. So if you're sensing a pattern, um, the pattern is this. Uh, the amendment process actually works, but when the Supreme Court short changes it and says, we'll do it ourselves, you don't need amendments anymore. You don't need amendments anymore. I mean, we didn't discuss this case, but in one case, Congress tried to pass an income tax. The Supreme Court struck it down. So then Congress passed the 16th Amendment. Happy April 15th, everyone, right? Congress passed the 16th Amendment providing for uh, an income tax. So lest it be said that the Constitution can't be amended, well, one of the reasons why we don't have amendments is the Supreme Court you know, changes the law for them uh, in many respects. Okay. Any question about the amendment process? Question amendment process. No? No? Nicholas, you're right? Good. <laughs> Were all the schools closed today? Yeah. 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 Well. What, everything's closed? Rice is, Rice is closed. You got you got you get screwed. I guess you're you're here. <laughs> 
Daniel, you are all here learning about free speech. So it's a much better scene. All right, let's let's talk about uh, Baron. Uh, let's go over there. Um, Travis, you want to talk about? Uh, tell me the facts in Baron, please. Sure. Um, so basically, the uh, in the city of Baltimore, they basically messed up the wharf where they took a lot of water out and reduced the amount of water that was in the wharf, and this guy was damaged because it, it made the water so shallow that boats couldn't fit in it. Yeah. So he was injured, so he sued, and he was trying to claim that the liberty interest in the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment applied to the states as well. Okay, very good. So does everyone know what a wharf is? I realize we're in Texas. That might be a foreign term. A wharf is a harbor. Um, and Baltimore is one of the, one of the uh, uh, best harbors on the East Coast. It's a very uh, well-known harbor with a lot of commerce and trade. Um, as it turned out, the city of Baltimore took some actions that made the water near the wharf very shallow and basically ruined the guy's business. I mean, no boats, no business at his harbor. He sued in state court, claiming that this was a taking of property without compensation. Now, as I'm sure you all know by now, in the Fifth Amendment, the very last clause, we go to page, uh, page 44, the very last page of the Constitution, it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay? So if the federal government takes your property, they got to pay. I won't quote the Rihanna song, but they got to pay. <laughs> so we got that. Good. I'm not saying it. Google it. So, work, work, work. No, I don't, I don't like that song. It's weird. I can't understand the word of it. It's weird. So, so, we're the Constitution, right? We're the federal government taking this property. They would have to pay. But the state of Maryland did not have a similar provision in its constitution. So, Dan, what did what did what did Mr. Barron do? Uh, well, I think he appealed and he lost, and then he went. To well, the no, no. What was his claim, though? What 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 was the initial claim before we get to the appeals? Uh, that by, I guess, creating the situation where the water was lower, somehow deprived him of his property. Under which constitution? Uh, was he suing under the under Maryland the constitution? Yes, okay, so he was suing under the United States Constitution, right? And he argued that under the U.S. Constitution, the states were bound, and the states could not take his property without showing him his money, so to speak, okay? This didn't work out. It did not work out. So I often make fun of Chief Justice Marshall. Um, it was actually funny. I was giving a talk at the John Marshall Law School in uh, what the hell, Chicago. There, there are two. I was in the one in Chicago recently, and I was ripping on Marshall, and the professor was like, you realize you had a law school named after him? I was like, oh, that's, that's a good point. But I often make fun of Marshall. This is a good opinion by Marshall. It's actually very textually rigorous. He makes, I think, pretty sound arguments. So I will give him credit where he's due. So, of course, Marshall holds that the Ten Amendments, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bill of Rights, it's really the first eight amendments. And I'll make this point briefly. Amendments 9 and 10 aren't really amendments that um, can be incorporated. We discussed this with Griswold, if you recall. Um, the Ninth Amendment says that the rights not enumerated uh, by the Constitution uh, are reserved to the people. Okay? Um, that doesn't really vest any rights for the states. It doesn't limit the states. Um, the Tenth Amendment makes even less sense to incorporate because it basically says power is not given to the federal government, it's given to the states. Right? It's, there's nothing to there's nothing to extend to the state. So really, we're talking about one through eight uh, of the amendments. So when I discuss, I'll say the Bill of Rights a shorthand, but I'm really talking about the first eight. So um, tell me, Taylor, what was the what was the focus of John Marshall's um, analysis? How did he come to the conclusion that the takings clause, among others, did not extend to the states? Well, he focused on the verbiage, the, the words, verbiage. The I like that. Uh -huh. and held that the only case where he could find that they applied to states was where they explicitly spoke of the states. Said, Good. No state shall, the states <laughs> mentioned the state of the permanent and Very good. If they wanted to do otherwise, they would not. Very good. So if you go to Article 1, Section 9, it's on page... We haven't, if you notice, the past couple weeks, we haven't really cited the Constitution between the 14th Amendment. There's actually 
text here, right? We, we can look to. Uh, the Kennedy opinions don't give you much occasion to look at this thing. So if you go to Article 1, Section 9, it's on page 25, and if you flip to the next page, 26, okay? Article 1, Section 9 imposes various limits, okay, on the states. Article 1, Section 10 imposes other types of limits on the states. And the point Marshall makes, I think, is very sophisticated. So there's one of them, right? We discussed this. Article 1, Section 9 says, no bill retainer or ex post facto law shall be passed. Okay? Um, uh, Zachary, does this specify who the law applies against? Just, just this one right here. Does it say who can't pass a bill retainer? No. Okay, good. Now, Zachary, we, we go down to the next page, 26. Article 1, Section 10. Do you need a tissue? Does he need a tissue? Is he okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I'm finally being that cold. It's finally gone. Okay. Article 1, Section 10. It says, no state shall pass any bill of attainder ex post facto law. So, Zachary, we have this one provision in, in 9 that says, no law shall be passed ex post facto. And then the next section, it says, no state shall pass a law ex post facto. How does Marshall read those two provisions in parallel to understand whom the Constitution binds? You would have to look at, um, I mean, he went through the structure and sort of looked at the provisions. No, 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 no. Let, 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 I want to, Zach, let's focus on this point. If in Section 10 it says states can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. And in Section 9 it just says it can't be done at all. Who must it be referring to here? Bingo. Everyone understand what we just said? If in 10, it specifically says states can't pass ex post facto laws, and then in 9, it says they can't be passed, period, right? Zachary said, I think correctly, when Congress wants to limit the states, they say it expressly. When they don't say anything, they leave it open, that means it's for the federal government to be controlled. Everyone understand that point? Okay, he's okay. You can say it nowhere. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. You can say it. Don't worry. It's it's cute. It's cute. It's okay. You can say. It. It's cute. I like his hat. You want? Does he not want to stay? Do you want? Okay, want to sit up here? Big 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 boy seat? No. <laughs> No, he's good, he's good. Let him say. Let me try to make that point again. When, when the Constitution wants to control the states, they make the point expressly. They say, no state shall make an ex post facto law. When the Constitution speaks in general terms, right, no law shall be passed, well, then they're referring to the federal government. Everyone get that principle, right? When Congress wants to intrude into state sovereignty, they're going to make it clear. They're not going to leave up to implication, right? So, Helen, let me ask you this question. When the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says, nor shall private property be taken for, uh, for uh, also, uh, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, that's general, right? Who is that then applying to according to this, this, this framework? <coughs> Which government? <laughs> right. How do we know that the takings clause does not apply to the state based on this line of reasoning? Bingo. When the Constitution's framers, those great patriots he spoke of, his friends, right? When the Constitution's framers spe uh, specifically said states, they were controlling the states. When they left it open, it only meant the federal government. And I think this is a very sound textual argument. Um, and there's a policy reason here as well. The policy reason is that the, uh, uh, the anti-federalists were very concerned about this Huge central government infringing on states' rights, right? They were encroaching on states' rights. <coughs> to alleviate this fear, the general idea was, we're going to let the states do whatever they want, unless we make it specific that they can't do it, such as this ex post facto, states can't make treaties, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, that I mean, this is a, 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 an entirely correct reading of the text of the Constitution consistent with history. I mean, when Marshall wants to, he can be a good judge. Just, you know, that wasn't always his goal. When he wanted to, he can get the right answer. That was not what he was always seeking. Um, so uh, uh, I think that, that, I mean, that, that part you get, right? 
Now, uh, let's see. Clayton. But how is this fair, right? Maryland just screwed over Baltimore, a, a baron. They just took his business. Why shouldn't he be able to get compensation for the fact that they destroyed his business? Not fair. What can, what, what can Barron do short of trying to get the Bill of Rights to protect him? What, what remedies does Barron have available to him? Under what law? Which, whose law would create that? Yes. How can Barron seek relief under state law if it doesn't already have this cause of action? How can Barron seek relief if a state doesn't already provide a cause of action? What could he do? It's a question lawsuits ever think about. What can he do if the law doesn't provide him relief? Yes! This is the answer lawsuits hate thinking about. Lobby for a new law. If Maryland does not permit compensation for taking property, he can go to his representative and say, hey, vote for a new law to give me compensation, and I'll get all my friends to vote for you. I'll fund your campaign. I'll fund your super PAC, whatever, right? This is how democracy works. Or, right, Kaysen, what else could he do short of amending his statute? What, what else could he do if it's a really big deal? Amend which amendment? Which is easier to amend? Is it the, should you go right to the federal constitution? Bingo. Why do we need to make this entire big federal constitution issue? Maryland is a constitution. It can be amended. And let me tell you something. It's a lot easier to amend a state constitution than to amend the U.S. constitution. You don't need two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of states. You guys all vote in Texas. It's, you, know, you flick a thing on the ballot, and then you vote to amend your constitution. The state constitutions are much easier to amend. And that's actually Marshall's point. The framers wanted the protection of liberty to be closest to the people in the states. And the states, through their ballot initiatives, through their amendment process, could then protect whatever rights people wanted. They didn't need the U.S. Constitution to intrude upon them. Right? Maybe Maryland decided we shouldn't compensate for taking property. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe Maryland wants to use that money for something else. That's up to their prerogatives of what they want to accomplish. All right, so the holding was the federal constitution does not apply to the states. And if the uh, people in Baltimore don't like this, they can amend their own constitution. Don't come to the U.S. Supreme Court for relief. Everyone with me so far? Okay, any questions on that? Well, so I already spoiled the ending of this book. As it turns out, that plan didn't work so well. <laughs> the initial goal was to allow the states to protect their liberties of their people through the democratic process. That didn't work out so well. Um, slavery, for one, meant that a significant portion of the population could not vote. And they were in no respect represented by the government. And their governments violated every provision in the Bill of Rights routinely. They censored the speech of abolitionists. They shut down abolitionist newspapers. By abolitionists, I mean people trying to oppose slavery. They shut down abolitionist newspapers. They shut down the churches of abolitionist clergymen. Indeed, there were, there were, there were a significant number of, uh, of white people in the South who opposed slavery, and they were, uh, by and large, religious people. They were, they were, they were men of the, of the cloth, and, the, and the, 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 the government shut them down. Fun trivia fact, when was the first gun control law enacted in the United States? Oh, God, you're good. Georgia. Yeah. Why was it inactive? They didn't want to reach the actually none. Yes. The first gun, it was actually before this, but even before the 14th Amendment, the first gun control laws were in Georgia to disarm the blacks, right? Why? If I'm the Ku Klux Klan, I like when they can't fire back. If I'm going to lynch someone, I don't want them firing back at me. In fact, one of the first 14th Amendment cases I mentioned, a Crookshank, was actually involving the Colfax Massacre. Remember about that? Tell us. Oh, I, I don't really oh, okay. So you had it. Okay. The Colfax mask was this horrible thing where basically there were a bunch of uh, uh, freedmen, uh, free blacks, and I think they were, they were in a church, and they were basically being assaulted from all sides by, by this lynch mob. 
and, and, and they weren't allowed to keep guns to defend themselves. So they basically seized their guns and they all died. And they sued and the Supreme Court held, well, you know what? The Second, Second Amendment does not apply to the states. These guys can't have guns. There's a very racist history of gun control, which people don't quite appreciate. Um, uh, does anyone know why California banned open carrying of, of weapons? Ronald Reagan did it. Because the Black Panthers would walk around the Capitol grounds in Sacramento with rifles on their back. That's why California bans open carry. It's a very interesting history of gun control, which I, I, I used to teach Heller, but a Burgerful displaced it. Lest anyone say I'm biased, I cut my lesson the second I'm a teacher uh, 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 So <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have time for that anymore. So the second myth, they, they, they had unreasonable searches and seizures of, of the slaves. They had no quarters, you know, privacy. They could search wherever they want. Were they given due process of law? No. Were they given a jury trial? No. They were hung on a noose if there was any accusation. Cruel and unusual punishment? My God. They, they were brutalized in every way you could think of. So systematically, every provision of the Bill of Rights was violated by states against their slaves. And no, the slaves were not able to lobby and give to a super PAC to amend the Constitution. That didn't quite work out. So the 14th Amendment changed that. Okay? The 14th Amendment changed that. How it changed it is complicated. So we've already discussed a few of the cases where the 14th Amendment was just ignored. We did one case, Slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse said, hey, there are all these new privileges or immunities that the state can't violate, one of which is the right to earn an honest living. Now, that case involved a butcher shop, which now may seem trivial, but if your profession is a butcher and you want to you know, you have a business for yourself to feed your family, that was your livelihood. And New Orleans said, no, nah, you can't have this butcher shop. We only have this you know, one centralized place. Went to the Supreme Court. What did the Supreme Court say? This privileges or immunities clause is meant to refer to a very small set of federal rights. If anyone actually read the dissent, which I, I hoped you had, you'll recall that the dissent said this, this body of rights, these privileges or immunities, includes the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Remember this? Does it sound familiar? The dissent by Justice Field, you can go back and check it, said among these privileges or immunities were the first eight amendments of the Constitution. In the view of Justice Field, which I think was, was absolutely correct, in the view of Justice Field, by passing the 14th Amendment, states could no longer violate free speech. States could no longer violate free exercise. Okay? States could no longer violate the right to bear arms. Totally unrelated to militia service, like the Colfax Massacre. But again, Slaughterhouse was in the dissent. Slaughterhouse, which, again, this is why I hate this case so much. It's a very bad case. This wasn't just about some obscure, you know, butchers, whatever. This case said it doesn't incorporate the Bill of Rights. Done. It does not include the first eight amendments of the Bill of Rights. So by the court failing to recognize that over the next uh, 70 years or so, the court slowly and incrementally incorporated various provisions of the Bill of Rights. Now, what do I mean by incorporated? They extended the Bill of Rights to the states. Now, the most logical way of doing this, I think the correct way, was with the Privileges or Immunities Clause. You would say that these liberty interests, which a state could not infringe, includes free speech, free exercise, whatever. But instead, the court used what we now know as substantive due process. That's why I said we're not quite done with the 14th Amendment yet. Indeed, when you ever see a single free speech case, it's not just a First Amendment case, it's also a 14th Amendment case. Let me explain why. In order to extend, in order to extend the Bill of Rights to the states, they said, okay, look, we have this 14th Amendment. It says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law, okay? And we've already discussed that this word liberty has taken on a meaning of its own. Go read a burger full and it means dignity and whatever else Justice Kennedy wants it to mean, right? But perhaps a more defensible conception of liberty are rights that are actually enumerated, such as the first eight amendments to the Constitution. So what the court has basically settled on 
is the liberty interests in the first eight amendments of the Constitution are so important, right? These liberty interests are so important, free speech, free exercise, that the state cannot violate them. No amount of process will allow the state to violate your free speech. No amount of process will allow the state to violate your free exercise. So through this doctrine of substantive due process, this liberty clause has gained its meaning, which includes the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Now, the court didn't just come out in one day and say, you know what? Bill of Rights applies to the states. Instead, they approached something called selective incorporation by our favorite Justice Brennan, um, which basically said, well, we'll take it one case at a time, right? Free speech, bring a case. Uh, a criminal jury trial, bring a case. Um, a Fourth Amendment, bring a case. And I, I lost count, but there were dozens of cases throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s even, where each provision of the Bill of Rights, not all, but virtually all of them were incorporated. Okay. Um, believe it or not, there are a couple provisions of the Bill of Rights that have never been incorporated. So, for example, a grand jury. Everyone know what a grand jury is, right? A grand jury means that before the government can bring a criminal charge against you, a group of people, a group of your peers, might say, okay, there's enough evidence to go forward. Okay. This was viewed as a check on prosecutors, that if your own peers think that a case doesn't have enough merit to go forward, then it shouldn't. What check this provides today, I don't know. It's often said that, uh, a good prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. He can, you know, he can indict anything. You don't need much to indict. It's a pretty loose standard. But it existed. In a case from the 1890s by, uh, uh, called Hurtado v. California, the Supreme Court held that the grand jury indictment was not incorporated. That didn't apply to the states. Justice Harlan dissented in that case. Uh, and so since then, yes, yeah, states like California, otherwise, they don't have grand jury indictments. How do you prosecute someone? The prosecutor files a document with the court, and that's enough. It's called an information. The, the prosecutor files an information, he can go with it. So in a number of states, we don't have a grand jury requirement. Another one that's actually kind of crazy. I think two states, Oregon and Louisiana, don't require a unanimous jury to convict for criminal matters. I think in Oregon and Louisiana, check me on this, I think it's Oregon and Louisiana, you can have a majority vote on a jury and you can have someone convicted of a crime. Um, the Constitution says you must have a unanimous jury, uh, but some states have non-unanimous juries. Um, I think those are the only two biggies. Um, and until 2010, the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, was never incorporated to the states. So unless the state constitution protected the right to bear arms, which I think Illinois and, uh, God, I think Illinois is the only one, oh, Illinois and Wisconsin, they don't have in their state constitutions, well, then you don't have that right. Okay? So, so, so that's how it works. Uh, but virtually every single right has been incorporated, and once a right has been incorporated, it applies the same for the states and the federal government. Um, the courts have one standard. They don't apply the rights differently. So questions on that. Yeah, John? Right here it says, nor shall any state define any state. How come uh, it took so long for, I mean, it's really right there. Isn't it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can understand if it's, if it's no, you know, it's only applied to federal state, how, to federal law. How can you? Well, I mean, didn't we, your question is a good one, John. Um, we did Slaughterhouse. I think I tried to convey to you how wrong the case was at the time. Now it seems even more wrong. Yeah. Again, the reason why people don't like slaughterhouse to learn is by this obscure thing by baking butchers, right? But the most important element of the case, which I didn't really mention, but I think I hinted at, is it said the Bill of Rights is not applied to the state. That was the big one. And that's why we say in the slaughterhouse case, the court basically wrote out the provision of the Constitution, right? It just, it just struck it out. It said the only liberty interests that apply are these very small set of federal rights, like going to the Treasury and, and freedom on the high seas and like these stupid these very insignificant rights. But that, that's why Slaughterhouse was such, a, was such a, 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 a wrong case, because it started this 70-year process where it took us literally till 
2010. I mean, I think most people were live at that year. I hope. Uh, you know, there'll come a day when my students will not have been live in 2010. I, I will. I will one day teach a class where my students were not live for Obamacare. I mean, it will happen. I promise. So you're exactly right. And this started this long process that wound up more or less in the right place 80 odd years later. So from my understanding, the first ten amendments to the eight amendments had some rights. The word for the fear, the liberty that the national political government for fear, and then the fifth amendment was defined liberty according to those ten amendments. No, and let, let, let me actually, I'm glad you asked that question. It's a perfect segue. So, um, uh, where is that? Uh, uh, so, Emma, does the First Amendment give you the right to free speech? I'll put it up here. I have it on the board. Does the First Amendment give you a right to free speech? Uh, answer my question. Does the First Amendment give you, does the First Amendment give you the right of free speech? What do you know? Well, what do you mean? We mean we we're thought the, the Constitution gives us rights. The First Amendment gives us rights of free speech. What do you mean no? Oh. Oh. You're the first one to get that right. Very good job. The First Amendment does not give you rights. The Constitution does not give you rights. This is the number one grievance when people talk about the Constitution. Oh, the Bill of Rights gives us rights. Even the name is wrong. It's not a Bill of Rights, which I don't even like the name. It wasn't even called that until much later. It's a Bill of Restrictions, which doesn't sound nearly as sexy, right? It's, it's, a, bill, it's a Bill of Limitations, if you think about it, right? Go through your Bill of Rights. Bill of Limitations, right? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or bridging through the speech. Second Amendment: The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Third Amendment: No quartering of troops. Fourth Amendment: Government can't do unreasonable searches and seizures. Fifth Amendment: Private property can't be taken without compensation. Go through them. You will not see an iota saying, "Oh yeah, we're giving this right of a trial by jury." It's awesome. No, no, it's you can't deprive us of the right of trial by jury. And this is not a semantic issue. This is actually this is actually quite significant, right? This is actually quite significant. So, uh, uh, Kiara, let me ask you the follow-up question: If the First Amendment doesn't give us the right of free speech, where did the right of free speech come from? It's innate. Innate. Oh, what is it? What do you mean innate? My, my exhibits, right? Like people cut my class to look at my trial, right? No. <laughs> what, 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 are the, what, what does that mean, innate? We have, our, we have autonomy over what we do. Oh. Interesting. So are you trying to say that our rights didn't come from government? Is that what you're... Okay, very good. Very good answer. <laughs> Sorry, but I didn't mean to put words in your mouth, but, but, but this is effectively the Declaration of Independence, right? This is, this is Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, the philosophy at the time, the frame of the Constitution, was such that our rights did not come from government. Indeed, our rights pre-existing government. Now, I'll stop there because there are different theories, right? Um, some people may say it's a matter of natural law, that we're actually God-given rights. Other people might say these are common law rights that came with us from jolly old England. I'll let you uh, 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 quibble amongst yourself of where these rights come from. But it was incontroverted that these were not rights that were given by the federal constitution. Instead, the federal constitution imposed limits, restrictions, on what the government could do. So it's not the case that Congress says, okay, you guys have free speech, good for you. No, no. You already had the right to free speech. The constitution doesn't say, you have the right to wear a hat. Right? There's no hat amendment, right? yet all of us, you two in particular, can actually next to each other also, you should have a, hat, a couple of hats. There's a few Aggie hats in every room, right? You two can wear a hat, and you don't need an amendment telling you that. The presumption is you can do what you want, right? And the government can't stop you. 
And this makes clear, this was the anti-federalist concern. It makes clear that you can't violate these rights specifically. Again, the anti-federalists were concerned that this government would try to censor speech, even though they lacked an enumerated power to do so. The concern was they try and censor speech. So they put these amendments in right in the Constitution. Um, a funny side note, the Constitution doesn't spell out how the amendment process works. And actually, James Madison had the idea of not adding them on at the end, but like incorporating them throughout in the middle. So it's like one document. Um, I think, who was it, Sherman? I can't remember who. No, I can't remember. Someone else said that's a really bad idea, and, and Madison relented. I'm glad he did, because it would be very complicated to actually try and piece out Constitution piece, you know, amendment here. So listening at the end is actually very easy for me to teach, at least. I think it will be uh, much more complicated. So the third proposed amendment, which became the First Amendment, provides six separate freedoms. Now, um, do you have any question I think I forgot to ask? Anything in your minds? Okay. So our First Amendment imposes six specific limitations on the central government. Six of them. So it begins, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment. I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to do speech last because uh, I don't get time to spend on them. But um, the first provision is Congress shall make the law establish respecting an establishment of religion. Now, um, I'm sure if I were to ask any of you before the semester starts, if I ask you about what does that mean, just like separation of church and state. It's the, the most common answer. Um, that free separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. I can't tell you how many times I go to high schools and even the teachers think that's in the Constitution. It's not. That phrase, has been, that phrase has been so effectively drilled into the conscience that people think it's, it's actually law. So where did the phrase separation of church and state come from? Anyone know? Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist where he discussed this wall between church and state. It had nothing to do with what we consider the Establishment Clause at all. Um, it was totally separate. But Justice Hugo Black uh, incorporated this into an opinion in the 50s or 60s. And now that's what people think the Constitution says. Um, let me give you a little history. When the Constitution was ratified, a number of states had established churches. Huh? Massachusetts and other states had established churches. So what does it mean that Congress can't establish its own church? Or they can't make a law respecting the establishment? What does this mean? That Congress can't screw with the state churches. It was a federalism provision. It basically means that Congress can't mess with state churches. If Massachusetts wants to make, uh, uh, you know, Calvinism, whatever it was, right? Lutheran, whatever the religion was, their state religion, Congress can't mess with that. It had nothing to do with keeping church out of state. It had to do with keeping church in state, and Congress couldn't mess with it. This is the most, probably the most misunderstood provision of the entire Constitution. <clears throat> It's bizarre. And people are like, oh, well, you know, if I say a prayer in school, whatever, that may be bad policy, policy, but this amendment says nothing about it. In fact, um, Justice Thomas has actually taken the position that this amendment cannot be incorporated. The entire point of the First Amendment Establishment Clause is to protect the states. How can it be that now the Fourth Amendment says, okay, now the states can't do this also? It, it makes no sense at all. Um, uh, I wish we had a class on the First Amendment religion clauses. We don't. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing topic, but it's, a, it's an infuriating topic also. It's probably the topic that makes me most upset, but it's most widely misunderstood. That's all you get. Sorry. I have no more time. That's, that's it. Any question on the Establishment Clause? I wish I could do a class on this. <sighs> Not enough time. I was actually really hoping they would not cancel class because I, I, I didn't want it to remove another class in a lecture. Property, I always put a spare date at the end. This one, I don't have any. Okay. Second one. Uh, Congress making law respecting a free exercise. We will cover this on uh, Tuesday. It's a week from today, so I'll, I'll hold off on this. Um, third. Congress make no law respecting, I'm sorry, or abridging the freedom of speech. <coughs> All right. What, what does that mean? Um, there are words here, and, and words 
have meaning, right? Not always, but they should have meaning. What does it mean to a bridge? What does no law mean? What does speech mean? What's the freedom of speech? So I'll give you perhaps the most textualist way of reading this. And that was the position of Justice Hugo Black. Justice Black was a, 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 the original originalist long before Scalia was around. And he said, Congress shall make no law means Congress shall make no law. He thought that every single restriction on speech was unconstitutional without fail, every single one. He says no law means no law. No law means no law. Uh, in fact, one of the funnier stories is that during the 1960s, um, there were a lot of obscenity cases where they would actually have to uh, uh, consider whether a movie was obscene and the state could criminalize it. So there was actually a movie theater at the Supreme Court. <laughs> they would screen these pornos at the Supreme Court. It's true. Um, and they would watch it to determine, is this actually obscene? Now, you know this. I know it when I see it, obscenity line. Now it makes sense. They were actually seeing it. They actually watched these movies. You're welcome. <laughs> so they were literally watching these movies together. I don't know. <laughs> I, I try to imagine. I really can't. A bunch of these old white dudes watching pornos together in the Supreme Court. I, I just, I can't, I, I can't, I know what happened, but I can't fathom it. But, oh, keep the headphones off a little nickel, sorry. <laughs> I, I forget he was here, sorry. Yeah. Um, but Justice Black refused to watch any of the movies. He says, these laws are all constitutional, right? You, I mean, these laws are all unconstitutional. You can't impose any limits on movies. So he, 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 uh, he passed on movie night at the, at the court. All right? The court has not adopted the Justice Black textualist approach to what the freedom of speech means, right? They've kind of ignored this no law part and they put more of their weight on this uh, abridging part, okay? Now, in a preview for class on Thursday, and this is something that drives law students mad, is we're doing scrutiny again. We're doing scrutiny again. Different types of speech are afforded different types of scrutiny. And indeed, for speech, we have a strict scrutiny, and we have an intermediate scrutiny, there's not really a rational basis. They don't call it that, but they may as well. But you definitely have a strict and intermediate scrutiny for speech. Okay? Well, you'll, you'll see this more in your reading for Thursday. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, just to make your outlines even more complicated, um, you're going to have scrutiny for, for due process with the fundamental versus non-fundamental rights. You're going to have scrutiny for equal protection with the suspect class, quasi-suspect class, and, and non-suspect classes. And you're going to have scrutiny for speech. Certain types of speech get strict scrutiny, and others get intermediate, as if this wasn't complicated enough for you. And oh, by the way, the court enforces these uh, uh, scrutiny for speech but as rigorously as they do for due process protection. In other words, it's very flimsy. So uh, uh, that is that that is your your blessing and your bane. Okay. Okay. Um, the fourth is the freedom of the press, okay? Now, uh, the meaning of this one has actually largely been lost. Um, for the most part, the courts have held that being a member of the press doesn't give you any additional protections. The First Amendment basically consumes a free press clause. <coughs> but at a minimum, this refl referred to the printing press. Um, at the time of the founding, there was no TV, there was no Instagram, there was no Snapchat. The way people communicated was by the printing press. You print out pamphlets, you print out flyers, um, and the way you get you stop people was to actually smash all the printing presses. This is how you put people uh, in jail. Um, in various cities that tried to control the press, the government would literally give licenses for printing presses, and if you printed something the government didn't like, they would take your license away. Um, I have to mention this briefly, but one of the biggest challenges of the First Amendment is Shortly after the Constitution was ratified, right, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act. The Alien and Sedition Act. This law made it a crime to basically speak ill of the government. It made it a crime to publish pamphlets and to publish newspapers that criticized the government. 
and you may be thinking, wait a minute, this is so awfully unconstitutional, right? Well, it was passed within a few years of the ratification of the Bill of Rights. So if the exact same people, the same generation who passed our First Amendment, were also okay with passing this Alien and Sedition Act, what does that tell us about free speech? And I'll leave you the flip side. Not everyone agreed with it. The Alien and Sedition Act was passed by the Federalist Congress. You recall from Marbury that after 1800, when Adams lost the election, the Federalists went away. This was their last -ish effort to protect themselves against criticism. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who were the Democratic Republican parties, um, they were opposed to this. In fact, Jefferson and Madison wrote documents known as the Virginia and the Kentucky Resolutions. And this is actually crazy stuff. Jefferson and Madison argued that these laws were unconstitutional, therefore the people did not have to comply with them. That because these laws were unconstitutional, no court had ever said so. They did not have to be complied with. <clears throat> this was the early roots of a doctrine of nullification. The idea that states and people did not have to follow laws that were violating the Constitution, even if the court never so held. So Jefferson and Madison firmly believed this. And when Jefferson became president, you know what he did? He pardoned everyone who was convicted under this Alien Sedition Act. And the law was promptly repealed. And in fact, Congress passed a statute uh, giving reparations, restitution basically, for those who were prosecuted under this, under this law. So the argument that, well, Congress passed the Alien Sedition Act doesn't get you so far because a lot of people thought these were awful laws and they were quickly repealed um, and not to be resurrected until World War I, which we'll get to in the next class. Okay. By the way, uh, Justice Brennan references this in his opinion in the New York Times for Sullivan case, but he's actually very careful. He said, this court never ruled on, on the Alien Sedition Act. You notice that? He said, this court. But you know who did? Take a guess. Who do you think ruled on the Alien Sedition Act? Take a guess. I heard it. Marshall. John Marshall as circuit justice, right? The justice back then would ride around the country and hold trials in different areas called circuits. John Marshall presided over a trial under the Alien Sedition Act as a judge, and he let the conviction go to a jury. So he gave it his blessing. Again, I'm not a Marshall fan for a lot of reasons. It slowly spills out. So Brennan was very careful. He said, this court, right? Not the great chief justice. This court has never passed on its constitutionality. And anyway, the guy who was convicted was ultimately pardoned by Jefferson, so I don't think there was an appeal. So the case just died. Yeah. Not a fan. Not a fan. Okay. Uh, number five, peaceably assemble. Um, this clause has basically lost all relevance. Uh, this was meant to um, allow people to basically come together and uh, 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 petition the government for change, the same way of a demonstration. Um, indeed, in England, you could not basically ask the king something. What you actually have to do is petition for relief. There was a process, right? You submitted a petition to the government, to the king, and hopefully they answered your, your, your prayer. You couldn't sue the king. Um, so both the assembly clause and the petition clause have basically been ignored. Instead, the Supreme Court has created a seventh freedom, right? There's a seventh one. So I'm sure you've all heard of freedom of association, right? We've all heard of this. Uh, does anyone see it? I don't. It's not there. So the court has basically read these other provisions to guarantee a right of free association. There was a case from 1958 called NAACP v. Alabama. Uh, the facts of the case were like this. Alabama was, was requesting the membership lists of all organizations. Okay, they didn't really want all of them, but they wanted the NAACP's membership list, which we used to harass people and intimidate them from joining. If Alabama now has your name and your address on this list, your life becomes difficult. Uh, the Supreme Court held that under this right of association that uh, Alabama, I'm sorry, Alabama cannot demand the membership rosters of these organizations. Okay? All right, everyone okay with that? All right, so any questions? I mean, I walked through that fairly quickly. Again, I could do an entire class and like, an entire semester on just this one, you know, paragraph, but but I, I I can't. Any questions on that? All right, David, you want to walk us through um, New York Times versus Sullivan, please? Um, New York Times versus Sullivan was uh, changed in response to the 
decision made favoring closing. Uh, New York Times, well, pretty much what happened was New York Times published an article. Uh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> Heed the rising Times voices. voices. Yeah. And it was an article that set out to raise funds to benefit Dr. Martin Luther King, who was in jail, person, I believe. Um, but the article never mentioned Sullivan. However, he mm -hmm. made a claim that because it made a reference to the police in Montgomery, and since he was the governor, I mean in Alabama, because he was the governor of Alabama, that it somehow was making a claim at him, and um, he felt that it went against who was in his character, whatever. So the first the decision in the lower courts was yes, his claim was valid, and they awarded him money. But then the Supreme Court went back and said, you know, just because they made claims about the police, didn't, they didn't really um, reference to him. And so they reversed the decision and they gave, um, said that publication can't, it was protected by the, publication was protected by the 14th and the First Amendment um, and no libel action could be brought against um, the publication by making a, um, by making a statement about a public official unless they knew um, unless they knew um, or had malice in making that particular statement. All right, very good. A couple of facts loaded off, but we'll clean it up uh, on the flip side. Thank you. So what happened here, um, before there was PayPal and GoFundMe, um, the way people raise money, by the way, don't trust those GoFundMe things. Those are always scams. Because I, I, he's always pop like, oh, there was a flood. Be very careful unless you actually know the person organizing. Because a lot of these are just scams. Uh, warning. So before there was PayPal and GoFundMe, these first internet, you know, micro fundraiser was it, um, you know, things to fundraise online. The way you would raise money is by putting an ad in a newspaper. Now, this is a litmus test to see how old people are. You know what this is in this, in this corner? That little dotted line thing. What are you supposed to do to this thing, this little dotted line thing? Let's see if anyone even knows. Oh, I'm glad you know that. Because I, 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 in a few years, I'll be teaching class where people won't know what that is. Yes. And it, yeah, I don't have to zoom in. You know that it's good. But the idea was you put this ad in the newspaper. You say, OK, here's this you know, bad stuff going on. We need your help. Um, cut out this little corner. You know, write your name, your address. Put some money in there, maybe, and, and mail it back to us. Right? This is how fundraising um, transpired. Okay. Right, so this was a solicitation for money. It was a, it was a fundraising letter. Um, you can either mail it to people, you know, or you can put it in a you know national newspaper, and hopefully you get funds. Okay. So let's walk through uh, um, uh, Anna. By the way, I always raise this point, but lest it be said that corporations have no free speech rights, this is a corporation asserting free speech rights. That's a newspaper makes no difference, right? It was a commercial enterprise. It was an advertisement, and the court walks right past that. So. Next time you hear that Citizen United is like Dred Scott, you'll have another rejoinder. It, it, was, it was unfathomable that because the New York Times was a company, they couldn't raise for it, it was not even considered, even though it was selling advertising space. It wasn't editorialism. Anyway, Anna, how did the New York Times go about running um, this ad? <coughs> what process did they go through before they put this ad in the, uh, in the paper? Um, there were a group of people who Okay, very good. So basically, you had this group of civil rights leaders, right? And they go to an ad agency and they say, you know, we have this ad, um, we have, you know, this narrative we want to tell, the story about these various civil rights issues going on in, in Alabama. Um, and Anna, I think you said it correctly, but did they do any fact checking? Did the New York Times try and like check this up themselves? No. Okay, they they took their word for it, right? Okay, there was no Google back then, right? I know this sounds really easy for us to say today, but finding facts in the nineteen sixties was hard. They would probably have to go down to Alabama, pick up the local newspapers, read through them, and and actually put in a considerable amount of work before they can run this advertisement. You can imagine that imposing this cost on a newspaper would make it very difficult to run these sorts of advertisements because, again, you have to fact check not just the narrative but every sentence, right? 
if a couple words are here, if they're singing this song versus that song, if there were this many people versus that many people, if he was arrested four times or set whatever it was, seven times, those are very specific facts. And if one word is off, right? That's a lot of research you have to perform to uh, cover yourself. So none of that research was done. They said, okay, you know what? We're going to trust these civil rights leaders, uh, that, that they're good people, that we trust them. And again, they were raising money. And, and not to make this point, but they have an interest in making things seem perhaps a little bit worse than they are. Um, not, not that they're lying, but perhaps there was a reason why they feel suspicious. But, but, but we'll put that aside for a moment. Now, did you guys read this in torts? I usually do. Okay. So I love doing cases you've done in other classes, but I can give it from a different angle. Okay, so you, you've done libel, right? So you understand how, how libel how libel generally works. Um, if you make a statement that injures another's reputation, um, uh, unless you prove it's true, generally speaking, you can sue for damages. Now, did you discuss the First Amendment much when you did this case? <coughs> There's just tension, right, between libel laws and the First Amendment. There's this tension. Because generally speaking, right, I can say whatever I want, and I'm not bound by the First Amendment. But if a court orders me not to say something, if a court orders me to pay damage if because I said something, that's state action. And the court's involvement is what brings libel law under the scope of the First Amendment. Now, historically, going back, even before, before we had a constitution, there was always libel cases. And it was always the case that the only defense of libel is truth. You had to assert that the matter was true, and that dismisses the case. Um, we have the Alien and Sedition Acts, which said you can't speak ill of the government. Were those consistent with the First Amendment? Maybe yes, maybe no. But in any event, the New York Times runs this advertisement, okay? Um, Delaney, what happens after the Times runs this commercial? They run a commercial and then, uh, that's when he brings to Who's he? Uh, the governor. Well, he wasn't the governor, he was the commissioner. Or the commissioner? Yes. No. Okay, so here he is. This is L.B. Sullivan, the Public Safety Commissioner in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, and he found it libelous. Um, here he is. I think he's a pretty tall guy. This is him. He's basically as tall as a horse, so he's, he's pretty tall. Uh, here he is talking to police officers. I actually found a family photo. Uh, a little bow tie. Okay, so that, that's Sullivan, right? Well, okay, oh, go ahead, please, can you? They, uh, go ahead and print it and protect retraction. Did they print a retraction? Yes, they did. No. Uh, they, request, they requested a retraction. Okay. After, after, after Sullivan requested a retraction, what did the New York Times write back? John? He wasn't putting it back. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the guy writes, says, I want you to retract this commercial, and then your contract back, it's not about you, right? It's not about you. So, John, walk us through some of the, um, uh, some of the claims in this um, commercial that, that were probably problematic. I thought it was because he was a part of the number. Yeah. So even though his name wasn't in it, what about it implicated the, the commissioner? Sam, you want to take a step? Uh, well, in uh, Alabama state law, said if, if you write something about the state agency, then the commissioner uh, yeah. could. <coughs> yeah. Basically, this commission, his authority was over the police. And under Alabama law, how they structure their governance, it was basically him, right? Um, this, I mean, we could probably argue this point, but it's not a very essential point, so I don't want to labor on it. Um, so uh, 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 Sullivan says, hey, this is about me. Under Alabama law, I'm required to request retraction. In other words, print saying this was wrong. If you fail to do that, I go to court. So indeed, he requested retraction. New York Times said, are well, you crazy? This is not even about you. Uh, other lawyers probably didn't expect this to happen. And then they go and sue, um, not just the civil rights leaders, but they sue the newspaper. Why? The pockets, right? The, the, back then, newspapers had money. Uh, people read them back then. Not anymore. 
Uh, I was actually on the plane today this morning. I had a newspaper. And I said, wow, he's actually reading a newspaper. You don't see that very often. So they sued. Okay. Um, Anthony, what was the basis then of Mr. Uh, Sullivan's claim? Okay, so walk into what were the libelous, or what were the purportedly libelous statements that the newspaper made? Um, I guess you have okay. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so I mean, uh, let me show you the commercial again. This, this is a scan from the Library of Congress. So I mean, it, it, it's a full page ad, right? Heed the rising voices. And then there are a bunch of paragraphs in the middle, and below that they list a number of names of these various civil rights leaders who have endorsed this commercial. Um, they tell a narrative of some of the um, civil rights issues going on in Montgomery, Alabama. So, I mean, some of the errors are pretty trivial. So, for example, the commercial says, they saying my, my country tis of thee, or I think they say, you know, God bless America, right? You know, small thing. But then they said things like, you know, the police armed with shotguns and tear gas ringed the campus. Um, that, that didn't happen. They said that they padlocked the students in order to starve them into submission. Um, that, that sounds awful. It, it, it didn't happen. Um, it said that Dr. King was arrested seven times. Uh, he was arrested four times. You know. I mean, not that's big, but, you know, that maybe that's a mistake they made, but they're exaggerating. But, you know, it, it's factually incorrect. Um, these were false statements. So usually, if a person makes a false statement about you in a newspaper, you sue them for libel. And then their defense is saying that it's true. In this case, King was arrested four times on seven. You can't say seven instead of four. That, I mean, that, that, that's really the rare case where it's actually easy to prove truth of the matter asserted. Four is not seven. These are not numbers that are equal. Um, so the question becomes, what happened? So, uh, uh, Paul, how does the court then um, approach this issue where there are clearly false statements being made at Mr. Sullivan? Um, do you want like, how the lower court found it? Yeah, walk me through it, whatever. Okay. Go for it. Um, first court found for the plaintiff, um, and then Alabama Supreme Court affirmed that decision. Okay. Um, and the Supreme Court. Basically, first. Um, okay. Why? Why did the Alabama courts rule in favor of Mr. Sullivan? I mean, the answer is actually pretty easy. If you cite this case in torts, what was the, 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 the standard? The common law, yeah, right? Yeah. The common law rule for you know, <laughs> at least since the 1700s, probably going back further, was that if you print a false statement about someone that injures reputation, I mean, you guys. Stand up and recite the elements better than I can. Um, but if you if you injure someone's state uh, a reputation with a false statement, and the person can't prove it was true, damages. Right? I might I took towards many years, but I think I think that's right. The issue of uh, of libel laws had never really been implicated for the First Amendment. It simply was not an issue. But then we have Justice Brennan, uh, and Justice Brennan does what Justice Brennan does. So uh, Zachary, walk me through Brennan's analysis. How does he get from Libel laws is whatever the state wants it to be. To libel laws are now different. What's his What's his mode of reasoning here? Uh, Brennan uh, approaches it and says that uh, if a statement <coughs> is regarding a public official, there's an exception created that uh, allows um, people to criticize um, the uh, person more so because uh, they're in that. Um, okay. So Brennan just makes some stuff up, and I, I, don't, I don't mean this lightly, but I think you're, we're friends now. We're class 26. You're used to it. Um, so he, I th he think he makes actually a fairly strong policy point, which I alluded to before. The policy point, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're a newspaper and you're considering running these sorts of fundraising letters, these commercials, if you have to take it upon yourself to determine if every single fact in a statement is accurate, you're not going to run these commercials. There's not enough time in the world to fact check every single sentence, every single commercial you have. Okay? You can't. So what Brennan says is, were we to impose a standard 
that any false statements printed in a newspaper give rise to a libel action about a public figure. That would chill speech. What do I mean by chilling speech? The newspapers would just stop running these commercials, right? If you're a lawyer for the New York Times and you lose this case, you're gonna think very carefully before you run another one of these commercials, right? You're gonna say, you know, it's not worth the money. What do we make, a few thousand dollars for the commercial and like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in legal fees? Not worth it. The subtext of this case, which wasn't stated, but this was a civil rights era. And southern states were using whatever legal tools were available to them to suppress the civil rights movement. I mentioned a couple minutes ago the case of NAACP v. Alabama, where they tried to uh, request the membership rosters of the NAACP. This, that, I mean, that was an intimidation technique. There's no, there's no mystery about what they were doing there. Here, too, Sullivan's lawsuit was an intimidation technique. He said, look, you guys want to write editorials about me? I'm going to spec and read every single word, and if one word is off, I'm going to sue your asses. Well, I said that. But yeah, you got, my, you got my drift. It's been a long day. I was up at like, it's a long day. I, I, I'm seeing like seven of you after this. Hopefully you all, you all, you all appreciate it, uh, but I'll be here for a while. Oh, so in terms of office hours, I'm, I'm booked. Um, at this point, if you haven't emailed me, um, it's, it's, it's over. I, I'm going to be here until about 7 o'clock every single night we have classes until the end. So if you haven't already, you should have, but I have appointments basically until 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. So um, Godspeed. I actually, because someone emailed me right before class. and Sorry. But I, I, I think I met with a majority of you uh, and everyone who wanted one, but um, I am out of appointments at this point. So. Um, this would have chilled the speech and intimidated the civil rights movement. So as a policy matter, um, Brennan makes a very fair point. Now, the part where he just starts making stuff up is concerning public officials. He says, well, it's okay if you have a libel suit against someone who's not famous, right? Because they can't really defend themselves, they didn't put themselves into the public eye. But if you're a public official, you are more likely to be the subject of criticism, right? If you watch, you know, Saturday Night Live or The Daily Show, they don't make fun of anonymous people. I mean, maybe they do sometimes, right? But usually, who are they making fun of? Celebrities, politicians, you know, famous people. And Brennan says these are the exact people who deserve this sort of protection, okay? Even if that speech is critical. Even if that speech makes you feel uncomfortable, even if they use bold imagery to get your attention, that isn't quite right. Because I mean, if you think about it, this letter was trying to shock you. Right? I mean, that's what, it was trying to shock, saying, oh man, this stuff is bad. I'm going to write them a check. I'm going to go send them a letter, and I want to join their group. I want to you know, help this organization out. Okay. And I think this is an important point um, that often gets missed in these sorts of discussions. Okay. Uh, who we have to the next? Zulma. Why should courts protect speech that's offensive, that shocks you, that makes people feel uncomfortable? Like why? Why is it something worth protecting? Um, for policy matters. Or why? Tell me. I think you place your social views. Um, you know, it's like your facial for me. It's kind of like a way to make changes. But why? Why, why do we allow speech that makes people feel, you know, uncomfortable and, and at ease? Why is that the kind of speech that, that, that should get <coughs> protection? But what's the significance of using some sort of you know very um, language that invites to, that invites a dispute? Right? Why is that important language to have? To, to draw ah, to draw attention. What do you mean draw attention? Like the next case, the the case you goddamn racketeers, right? Or to use another case. Oh, are his earplugs in? <laughs> if I'm a hippie, which I, 
I am certainly not. <laughs> I am certainly not. But if I was a hippie and I want to protest the war, and I decided to walk into the courthouse with a jacket, and the jacket said, fuck the draft. Fuck the draft. You guys just, whoa, Blackman just said fuck, right? <laughs> There's actually a professor at Ohio State who actually died last year, Chris Fairman, wrote a book called Fuck, that was the title of the book, just one word. And it was about how jarring language gets your attention. It's like, whoa, what? Let me listen to him now, right? Jarring language that gets your attention, that makes you feel uncomfortable, it keeps your plug plug nice and firm, right? <laughs> I swear, whatever it was, last semester, another student brought her daughter to class when I was teaching the fuck lesson. So uh, <laughs> I guess it just happens to work out that way. Yes, keep watching the iPod. So, um, the, the language that makes us feel the most uncomfortable, that unsettles us, like the language here was meant to be very unsettling. This was not meant to be this, you know, bland. They want to draw your attention. And there's a case uh, cited in your reading called Terminello, which is an important case. Um, and the court says, let me read you a passage. He says, a function of free speech under our system of government is to invite dispute. It may indeed best serve its high purpose when it induces a condition of unrest, creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, or even stirs people to anger. Speech is often provocative and challenging. It may strike at prejudices and preconceptions and have profound, unsettling effects as it presses for acceptance of an idea. So imagine the situation I said before. I'm wearing this jacket in, the, in a courthouse. It says, fuck the draft. And this guy walks up and says, what the fuck are you doing with that? Why are you wearing that jacket? He's like, this war is unjust. It's like, no, you're an idiot. This is before Facebook, right? But no, you're, you're an idiot. This is not war. Like, you know what? Let's talk about it. You know how many people have died in this war? You know how Congress and vote for it? It's like, what do you mean Congress and vote for the Vietnam War? Oh. Getting someone's attention allows a conversation to happen. Now, in nine times out of ten, it was like, oh, fuck off, right? It was just walk away. <laughs> I'm using curse words on purpose because I'm trying to illustrate a point. Uh, it's not just idle cursing. Oh, his earplugs are so good. So, using this sort of language, you picked the wrong day to bring the kids to school. <laughs> using, using this sort of language is meant to jar people because when you jar someone, it's like, like, what are you doing? And then you start talking. But if it's like, I oppose the war, sign, no one's going to stop and talk to you. So the mere fact that, that that language makes you feel uncomfortable or unsettled, or to use the parlance of today, unsafe, harassing language, this is a very sort of language we should be trying to protect because it engages people. We think of speech in terms of a marketplace of ideas. This is the phrase Holmes used, one of his better opinions. Um, Holmes describes speech as a marketplace of ideas. We don't know what's going to work. Maybe fuck the draft will get your attention. Maybe end the war. Um, maybe LBJ is a murdering thug. Whatever the sign happens to be, we let people choose for themselves the mode of communication, and we don't decide for them what to be protected. So again, even though this ad had some falsehoods, it was meant to get attention. Okay, maybe they embellish seven instead of four. And maybe they made up the part with them padlocking the students, starving them to death. And maybe they made up this part about uh, uh, ringing the campus with, with shotguns and tear gas and whatever, whatever else, right? But the court says public discourse, matters of public concern are so important, we'll look past that. Did this injure the reputation of Mr. Sullivan? Maybe, maybe not. Did anyone even think it was about him? Probably not. But let's say, let's you know, argue. What if it said Sullivan in there? Right? You put his name right in there, the exact same commercial, and it said Sullivan right there. What the court basically settles on is that this is such an important matter of you know, discourse that we'll look past any injury to his reputation because we want people to be able to use a sort of exciting language to shock the conscience. This is why we protect speech. Um, and I'll, I'll digress briefly um, uh, because... Um, uh, it, it's actually quite relevant here. Um, did it, how many of you went to the event last week we had on, on free speech? Oh, good. A, 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 a goodly number of you. If you haven't, the videos on my blog, you can watch it later. It's on YouTube. Um, but we had an event last week with me, Professor Kelso, and a lawyer from a group called FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. And I thought we had a, you guys enjoyed it. It was a good discussion. 
you know, I think we had a pretty good discussion on free speech on college campuses. And um, one of the issues that, 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 that is very much um, at issue today um, is the issue of speech in colleges. So um, how many of you ever heard of the phrase trigger warning? How many of you ever heard the word safe space? Okay, so interesting. You haven't heard trigger warning for safe space. Interesting. Okay, so if I can, uh, anyone want to give me a definition for either one? Yeah. Safe space is like a place you could go. For I'm, I'm familiar with like the LBGT safe space that they had in my school. They could go and not be around any hate speech or whatever. From what's hate speech? Uh, okay, Sam. It's not actually. <laughs> that's pretty good. Actually, I promise. She promised she would ask me a question. What? Actually, I do remember until you made a wince at them. That, that, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second. Actually, ask me this question like in a minute, okay? We we we, we talked about this last week. So, uh, interestingly, you said a word that's interesting: hate speech. I'll repeat what I said last week. Um, that's not a real thing in the United States. I'm sure you were all taught wrong at every single juncture of your careers. How many of you were taught about hate speech in college? Oh, God bless you. Okay, you're, you, either you didn't pay attention or, or your teachers weren't doing a very good job, which is fine. Um, I like that you guys are learning this stuff. It actually makes me very happy. Um, in many European countries, speech that makes people feel uncomfortable is actually a crime. You can throw someone in jail for saying a racial slur. Or saying something about gays or lesbians or or politics, whatever else you want. If it if, it, if it's a a racially based comment, you throw a person in jail. Um, we don't have that norm in the United States. Um, a hate crime is a thing. A hate crime is a physical act it involves mens rea. So if you murder someone, you get one punishment. If you murder them with a mens rea, which you studied like a, a, I murdered him because he was black or white or Jewish, whatever else. There are various enhancements under state law. Okay? Hate crime is very different than hate speech. Merely saying, God hates facts, perfectly constitutionally protected, 100%. 100%. Back to case Snyder versus Phelps. That was an 8 1 decision at the Supreme Court. 8 to 1. Wasn't even close. You hold up these signs and even at a funeral. Okay? The idea of the safe space, and this is why I mentioned it. It's not just that people of like, uh, of, of like interest can get together. It's people who disagree are not allowed to speak. So there's actually an incident going on at, at this moment at Harvard Law School um, uh, where there's basically a lounge which has been occupied by a group that's trying to um, get the school to think about racial issues differently. And they're calling it their safe space, which you know, which sounds fine. But if someone who disagrees with them enters that room and tries to put a sign on the wall, they tear it down. The idea of the safe space is not just that you're with your own kind, but that others are not allowed to speak in a way that might offend you. Um, this is dangerous, and I don't say this lightly. Uh, this is dangerous because it teaches you that if there's speech you don't like, the answer is to censor it and not listen to it and not hear what other people have to say. Um, no doubt it makes people feel uncomfortable to hear things that are, that are jarring like, God hates fags or fuck the draft. But it involves a discussion saying these Westboro Baptists are insane. The war is a good thing, whatever it happens to be. Um, the issue at Harvard is, is somewhat complicated because it's not a public school, it's a private school, so the First Amendment doesn't apply directly. Um, the second thing I ask you about is a trigger warning. Okay? I'm actually grateful you don't know what this is. Um, a number of professors and students um, have asked professors on the syllabus to put a warning if there'll be something offensive to be taught in a class. That way the student can excuse himself or herself from the reading. Um, Greek mythology involves a lot of non-consensual sex, if you ever say Greek mythology. And students at Columbia have actually asked to be excused from reading that Greek. I mean, most of the Greek gods were born from rape, and this, this is basically the, the history of Greek, Greek mythology. And uh, students at Columbia have actually asked to be excused from reading in a classics class because it may, it may be triggering. The idea it may trigger uh, experiences that make them feel uncomfortable. Um, fortunately, again, we don't have these at this law school, although other law schools do. Um, I think there's always a way of approaching material in a responsible manner. And I, I try my best. Maybe I don't always succeed, but I try. Um, but uh, I, I, 
I have deep reservations about warning students in advance not to come to class or not to the reading. You, you guys will love it, up to the reading, right? That's awesome. But because it may f make them feel uncomfortable. We do some heavy stuff in this class, right? We do slavery, right? We do eugenics. Uh, we do abortion. We do gun violence. I mean, we do some pretty violence against women. I mean, we do some pretty um, weighty stuff. And I think all of you are very mature uh, and responsible in covering it. And I'm sure at points this semester I've offended you. I'm sure perhaps poor Nicholas today I've offended him many times. But part of the reason why I use offensive language and risque language is to get your attention. Again, this is not inadvertent. This can be a somewhat boring class uh, uh, and maybe bored at times in law school. Using jarring things gets your attention, engages debate, and stimulates discussion, uh, which is what I try at all junctures to do. Now, Anthony had a question last week, right? And you want to ask me? I can paraphrase it. What do you want? I told you to remember. <laughs> okay. So, so, so Anthony, uh, after after the event last week, she asked come up very nice question. She asked, um, you know, but what about harassing language? Right? That, that's your question, right? If I remember it correctly. What about like? I, I want to sure I get it right. I don't want to script your question. Okay. I don't think okay. Okay. Wasn't what I said. Yeah. You want to try your question? Yeah. Well, maybe. What about like class A? I don't know if they're going to sound here. I don't like them because I don't know if they're going to sound here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Saying next thing, a racist, that's more like. Ah. Hey, well, well, just one at a time. I appreciate everyone's opinion, but let's try one at a time. I don't like having cross conversations. So, okay, continue, please. So, yeah. That's, I think, the advantage. Uh huh. So, should that be a crime? Should the state be allowed to fine a person or send them to jail for doing that? Do you think that that also incites hate crime? Incites hate crime. Okay. So what, is it, what do you mean incites? I mean, that's like an... Great, like, when? Like, when? Well, the speech by itself is a crime, or it leads to another crime. So I want to change your question. So I guess you're so angry or hateful, and that encourages others to do the same. Is that what you're asking about? I'm sorry. Is your question that the speech itself is the crime, or that you encourage others to commit a crime? I want to make sure I understand your question. I'm sorry. Is your question that the speech itself is the crime, or that you encourage others to commit a crime? I want to make sure I understand your question. Okay. Very good. So there's there's a reading I think I have assigned for next class, but I'll, I'll mention it now to answer answer Felipe's question. Um, case is called Brandenburg v. Brandenburg v. Ohio. I think it's for Thursday, if I remember correctly. And the facts of the case were like this. You had a Ku Klux Klan rally, right? You want to talk about a lot of hate in one room, right? You had a KKK rally. And you had this guy, Brandenburg. And he was up to saying, you know what? We're going to march in Washington next month, and we're going to go there, and we're going to do these racist things, and sell these horrible things, and do all these bad things to people. We're going to show them about white supremacy, and we're going to do this next month, right? And the police, actually, what happened was they recorded it, they aired it on TV. I don't know why, but you know, the even news needed something to air, and they aired this thing on TV, and then the police come and arrest the guy, saying, you were inciting violence. What do you think the problem with that one is, Felipe? If you're doing the reading, that's fine, but what do you think the problem with arresting the guy after the thing aired on TV <coughs> for inciting violence? I think the court approached that, is the guess. Yeah, but why? Why? Why do you think they rejected the claim there was any sort of incitement of violence? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. And now, anyone else? Say it again. Nothing happened. He was basically saying we're going to march in Washington next month. I mean, again, maybe next week, whatever it is, right? The court put down a test for the incitement of violence. They said it has to be imminent. Your speech must basically incite imminent violence, right? So you can imagine a situation where, um, let's just say it's July in Cleveland, and, and someone loses the convention. He says, you know what? Let's go right. Let's tear this motherfucker down. Let's burn this motherfucker down. And after that, people go and start tearing Cleveland down. Do you think that case will come out differently? How do you think that case will come out? 
imminence, right? The key thing is imminence. Now, actually, the language I just used was actually not from Donald Trump, but was actually from Michael Brown's stepfather. So after Michael Brown, uh, 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 his, his, the guy who shot him, was not um, uh, uh, convicted, um, the stepfather got on top of a car in Ferguson and said, we need to burn this motherfucker down. Let's burn it down. And indeed, a riot happened immediately after he said that. So he was never charged. Was, I think had a, a, there was a law professor at UCLA who made that his con law exam, final exam question. And I had a similar question in my exam that year independently. Uh, so that was, that was a good example. And the students objected to the exam because it was harmful. And they actually had the question stricken from the exam. Because it was too, uh, it was it was too, it was an insensitive question. In many respects, I love South Texas. I don't, I, I don't have the problem that my colleagues at other schools have, and I think you're more mature than a lot of people at schools that perhaps have uh, a big reputation. But I think you have a, a, a better grounding of reality uh, uh, than some people who are perhaps higher up in the ivory towers. But I think Felipe, your question is, is quite well taken. The court has settled on imminent as a standard, right? Merely saying eight, merely saying something that's awful. God hates bags, whatever else, right? That is considered awful, but protected. But if you're inciting someone to violence, and that's actually the last case, the um, uh, uh, the um, the Chaplinsky, sorry, the Chaplinsky, I'll get you a second to read. Chaplinsky case, right? They define the fighting word standard as imminent, right? Speech shall make going to punch you in the face right now. Right? That is the line where they, they draw. Now, a note on the fighting words doctrine, it's basically been overruled. Brandenburg basically overruled Chaplinsky. It's still taught. Fighting words is still a category, but it basically has no weight anymore. But, but even speech that makes you feel offended, that makes you feel angry, unless it actually incites violence and imminence, uh, the courts have protected it. Drink your hand was patiently waiting. Um, yes, sir. As a foreigner, I mean, I know that the United States is famous for freedom of speech. Yeah. But I didn't find any freedom of speech. Uh -huh. For a reason, who draws the limit of the freedom of speech? Do we follow the social, the prevailing social trend to say this is politically correct? We're going to follow that. If somebody invented that definition for how our speech should be regulated. Or are we free to say whatever we want to say without offending anybody? Everybody gets offended here. Every group gets offended. <laughs> and I really don't understand it. How do you claim there's freedom of speech and everybody's offended when you both tell them? Well, fortunately, offense is not a crime. I'll just second. Right at, at the moment, the courts say offensive speech is still protected. This is why you have this, the, the case that 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 that, uh, that that Sam mentioned a moment ago, the the the, the Snyder v. Phelps case. The facts were like this: you had a funeral of a service member, and you have these people, the Westboro Baptists. These are awful human beings. Awful. You don't live across here from them, do you? <laughs> these are these these are these are awful human beings. Um, their mission is to go to funerals and protest. And basically they hold up signs saying, God hates fags. And the reason why you died is because there's homosexuality in America. They have signs saying, thank God for IEDs, improvised explosive devices. These are, I mean, they say they were going to protest Scalia's funeral. Um, I don't think they actually made it because no one knew where it was. But it wasn't, the actual funeral was not publicly announced. But the court by the H1 margin said, this speech is definitely unsettling. It's protected. Even with, you know, you study the intentional infliction of emotional distress, that tort is also limited by the First Amendment. Right? Even if you shock someone with your speech, it's protected. So perhaps we see in popular culture, oh, this speech is offensive and that speech is offensive. For the time being, court's protected. Now, I don't think it's always going to be that way. Now, for those of you who were at the talk last week, I think Professor Kelso made a very astute point. Uh, uh, he and I don't agree on a lot, but I think we, we have a lot of similarities. Um, Professor Kelso said that there's a lot of wiggle room in the First Amendment. And there are various ways of interpreting harassment and fighting words. And perhaps as judges accept the sort of political correct norms, our expansive free speech, we dwindle down to approach what's in Europe. I think Professor Kelso made a very astute point about this, that the first time we have now is not frozen in stone. Um, it's not. To the extent that the courts interpret this in various means, and um, today's students who are protesting exam questions become tomorrow's lawyers, become tomorrow judges. And when they're judges, well, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask, to what extent 
I'm sorry, I, I hear it. Let's say it louder. Uh, first touch Answer your question actually uh, 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 backwards, if, if I may. Is he okay? He seems he seems very sick. So um, I, I I read before the quote from Terminello, and I'll, I'll read it again. And you may not agree with this, but I'll I'll, I'll read this. It says a function of this is by by the way Justice Douglas here, the author of Griswold. He wrote a function of free speech under our system is to invite dispute. It may indeed best serve its high purposes when it induces a condition of unrest creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, or even stirs people to anger. Speech is often provocative and challenging. It may strike at prejudices and preconceptions and have a profound unsettling effect as it presses for an acceptance of an ideas. So at least the speech that Justice Douglas described is that sort of hostility is actually conducive to discourse. Now, I think, Dominique, uh, 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 I, think, um, no, I, I, think I think, your, I think your point is well stated. Right? I think I think I, th I think your point is, is is well made, okay. And the the point is this. This is based on a reasonable person standard, right? It's based on a reasonable person standard. Chaplinsky even said what a, what a reasonable average person would think, right? If we get to the point where people agree, as a reasonable person standard, that this is the case then the First Amendment will change, right? I don't pretend, I don't profess for a second that the current conception of the First Amendment is written in stone. I don't, I don't make that point for a second. But I think your point's well taken. If enough people start to assume that this sort of hostile speech is no longer conducive to persuasion and is no longer conducive to an open discourse, then courts will start chopping away at it. I think that's wrong and, and, and I think it'll be quite dangerous if, if that norm prevails but you know legal battles are won and lost yeah well um we're talking about undergrad like people now have more of an option to gather together with folks that share their ideas for example mm -hmm. and so sometimes I think that you're not used to like hey hey like what do you mean by this like you're not doing a discussion we do discussions with people that we have in common. Mm -hmm. So, like, what I'm seeing sometimes during, like, with 9-11, a lot of people with the Muslims got together and it's like, okay, everyone who's, like, losing speaking a lot Islamic is a terrorist. And then we saw hate crime. I mean, that, that same thing, like, we didn't see other people like, hey, it's not true. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we didn't have that discussion. I'll give you another example. So you ever have the heckler's veto? Have I talked about this before? So have you ever been to an event where there was a speaker, perhaps was controversial, and someone tried shouting them down and made such a commotion that the person couldn't speak? Have you ever been to an event like this? That's an awful thing. Okay. The way to counter someone, historically, and maybe this will be different going forward, is with counter speech. Not at the same time to shout someone down. Because when you shout someone down, you're actually saying, what you're saying is not worth it, and I'm not even open to persuasion. If you sit there and listen, you're not persuaded, fine, then you're not persuaded. Then you can give a speech across the street, giving a different perspective. But the norm for far too many people is the answer to offensive speech is to silence it or disinvite speakers. It's actually very often the case that a speaker is disinvited at a college campus. Um, when you do that, you never hear the opposite perspective. Indeed, I'm fully aware that the opinions I give in this class are probably quite dissimilar from what your other professors in your education have given you, and I, I'm proud of that because it's very often the case that students never hear a contrary perspective. I mean, you can very well graduate all four years of law school and three years of, I'm sorry, all four years of college and three years of law school without having a single uh, registered Republican professor. I, numerically, it's possible. I see nods. So 
Um, the more opinions you're exposed to, the better you are. Um, it strengthens your opinions, right? It actually makes you a smarter person to so hear something different and say, well, I don't agree with that because of X, Y, and Z. And the entire process, well, this is why I don't agree, makes your opinion stronger. I don't ever try and persuade you. I don't even pretend that I can ever persuade you. Uh, that's never my goal. Uh, my goal is to, to expose you uh, to as many different things as humanly possible in my limited two hours with you, which are now down to three minutes. Yes, Sam? Um, I'm curious about where people, uh, I'm, I'm ex exercising my free speech to protest, and then a guy wearing a hat that says something along the lines of like, make America great again, you know, hits me. Because of that. You. Okay. And there's you know, no protections there. Actually, my little sister went to American University, and there was a very interesting thing. In where, Washington, D.C.? Yes. Uh, where Westboro Baptist Church came to protest, and they, do, they publicized it greatly, made a huge deal out of it. They were going to come tell all the, you know, this, their, their whole rhetoric of like spreading the love and telling all the kids they're going to hell. Only uh, so, so love them with their hell and damn uh, brilliant. She sent the, I think you saved the, the poster for it because it was hilarious. Anyway, it was like 10 degrees outside. Four of them showed up and they were in a little roped off area that was pre um, protected by the police um, for them to be in. And basically, all the liberal kids at American University had like a free love fest around it. And the, and the uh, Westboro Baptist Church people tried to get them to go away. Um, so it was like, wait. So you're talking about counter our speech. Free, our free speech is not, you're not letting us have our free speech and our little love fest. Do you think their, their love fest counter the hate message quite well? I think it's also hilarious on Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm sorry? All right, you can ask on Facebook later, right? <laughs> so um, these are important topics. And I, I, if, you, if you'll indulge me a few minutes past 220, I want to walk you through the categories of speech. Um, this is probably, in terms of things to remember, probably the most important thing today. Um, the court has generally taken the presumption that all manners of speech are protected unless it falls into specific categories of speech. And if a speech falls into this sort of category, it's not protected. Think of this as like the fundamental, non-fundamental distinction for a due process. Not exactly, but close enough. Generally, speech is given strict scrutiny, but if it falls into one of these categories, it's not protected. I mean, it's not really a rational basis, it's just not protected at all. So the first category is the Chaplinsky, the, the, the fighting words, right? Speech that will make a reasonable person come to blows and you want to knock you out. Um, this is still good law, but I'm, I'm telling you that the book makes a similar point. It has basically been read out of the Constitution. It doesn't really have much weight uh, uh, there. Here, I actually have a commercial about it. You're, you're, you're a goddamn racketeer. You're a damn fascist. Uh, the facts of this case were not like they were in the book. Indeed, there's basically a mob beating up this poor Jehovah's Witness. And he starts cursing at the police, and then the cop arrests him. Um, you notice the facts are never what they are. Yeah, basically this mob was beating up the Jehovah's Witness. Guy starts cursing, and then they arrest the Jehovah's Witness. Talk about a heckler's veto. Um, the second category is that you can't make threats. You can't say, I'm going to kill you. I am going to kill you. I'm speaking. What's the problem? Threats are not protected. Um, it gets tricky with things like cross-burning. There's actually a Supreme Court case about this. And what's the effect of cross-burning? A case called Virginia v. Black, uh, where... Basically, it's based on the intent where if you burn a cross in your backyard and there's no one there to see it, um, uh, that's not a threat. But if you do it, like, I don't know, in your front yard with all the people watching you, well, that's a different story. Um, libel and defamation are not protected. However, they're subject to the um, standard in New York Times or Sullivan, where if there's a public figure, you need to show actual malice, that the person actually had a, a, a desire to harm with these false statements. It wasn't just reckless or negligent, which was the case with the Times. <coughs> Excuse me, the fourth category is known as commercial speech. Commercial speech. This is a very fuzzy category, but generally means speech from a, some sort of a corporation. Uh, uh, this is what's historically given intermediate scrutiny. Um, I'm not going to ask you about this, because commercial speech is an absolute monster to figure out, and the cases are all over the place. <laughs> um, number five 
obscenity and child pornography. Again, pornography is constitutionally protected unless it's obscene. Well, what makes it obscene? Well, Potter Stewart famously wrote, I know it when I see it because he was watching all those movies. Um, I guess <laughs> uh, 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 he didn't go blind. But um, obscenity is usually defined based on uh, uh, standards of community decency. Standards of community decency. Um, what does that mean? Well, what it means is as society gets more, if I may, effed up, uh, uh, it's hard to find obscenity. And I'll give you an example. Two girls, one cup. <laughs> Not obscene. There's actually, there's actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right, there's actually an attempted obscenity prosecution against that movie, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you guys were, like, elementary school when that came out, I, I think. It was like 2006 or seven. <laughs> Number six, I'm almost done. Crime facilitating speech, speech that is used to carry out a crime, like giving someone instructions how to rob a bank, um, not protected. Okay, that's all I have. I thank you very much. If you have questions, please come up. Uh, I appreciate your extra two minutes of time today.